it's a real pleasure to welcome you all again. Today we will discuss, uh, we will continue the discussion that we started last week, uh, trying to shed light uh, through the lens of economics of how colonization has shaped the development of uh, Africa post-independence. Last week, we started with some introductory remarks and a conceptual framework that economics uh, researchers have tried to use in an effort effectively to so-called unbundle the colonial treatment. Last Wednesday, we had a dedicated session on the role of Christian missions and educational investments. While yesterday, we started discussing about the legacy and the impact of colonial roads, colonial railroads, more generally infrastructure investments that however came handy with very extractive institutions that took various forms across the continent. Also, they were quite heterogeneous even within contemporary countries across regions. So today we will continue this discussion about the role of extractive institutions and infrastructure developments. And we are extremely privileged, happy and honored to have two top-notch scholars who have done very important work on these and related areas with us. Actually, we have three very uh, uh, influential and important scholars. So let me start with Messai Gabriel Achier, who will moderate uh, the Q&A session. As always, please start sending us uh, questions and uh, Messai will try to organize them, group them and pose them to Belinda and Roland. So Messai Gabriel Achier is an assistant professor of economics at Amherst. Uh, now, I came to know his research actually on cultural institutions in the US. He has done some important work with his former advisors, I guess, at the Boston University, where Messai completed his PhD on rugby individualism in the US. But uh, Messai is also doing some interesting work on Eastern Africa, looking, for example, the role of infrastructure investments, uh, among others, and agricultural aspects uh, in Ethiopia and more generally in East Africa. So, Messai, thanks a lot. Uh, for being with us uh, today. Now, our two main speakers will be Roland Pongu and Belinda Archibong. Let me start uh, with uh, Roland. So Roland uh, works uh, as an associate professor at the University of Ottawa in Canada, and he spends a lot of time at Harvard University uh, at the Kennedy School of Government. Roland is doing a lot of work using mostly microeconomic uh, approaches on institutions and cultural aspects as well as health. And today he will present some exciting work uh, that he has uh, with uh, that uh, he actually uh, quite much related on the impact of infrastructure investments uh, in colonial uh, uh, Nigeria. Belinda Archibong uh, uh, will take the floor next. Uh, Belinda is uh, prof an assistant professor of economics at Barnard College uh, in New York City. Belinda has three degrees from Columbia University, my alma mater. Uh, from New York. Uh, uh, she studied development economics and she's doing very important work uh, on various aspects related to African development. Uh, she will present some fascinating work with Nonso Bikili, who we met earlier, uh, on the impact of prison labor wide, widely used uh, across colonial Africa uh, and its legacy. But let me also flag that Belinda, actually, I'm, I'm teaching one of her papers on the effect of the Washington Consensus uh, on Africa and the various adjustment programs that the IMF and the World Bank implemented in the continent without much success. Belinda has also been doing very interesting work on gender issues, on the impact of the pandemic in the continent. So, Messai, Belinda, and Roland, thank you big time for being with us and joining us in this uh, initiative for that Leonard, Stelios, Nathan and I undertook. And we're very privileged to have you all here. It's also, I think, nice that we Zoom in Nigeria where we have many guests and friends joining us uh, from Nigeria and West Africa more generally. But as always, uh, you know, the topics that we will touch upon and uh, uh, touch more generally uh, Sub-Saharan uh, Africa uh, and in some cases also North Africa. So Roland, the floor to you. As always, uh, you can start using the Zoom uh, uh, Q&A uh, facility. You can start posing questions. The teaching team will try to address some of them, but Messiah will collect and pose them to Belinda and Roland in the end. Thanks again. Thank you, Elias. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful introduction. Let me share my slides now. Yes, thank you again, uh, Elias, for the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I thank you as well as uh, Yonat, Nathan, and Stelios for organizing this uh, fascinating online course of 
on African economic history. I also thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, today I will be talking, as you mentioned, Elias, about uh, the impact of uh, colonial rail, rail, railroads on economic development with uh, a particular focus in Nigeria. So uh, this uh, research is joined with uh, Dozier, Dozier uh, who was here last week, and uh, Chik Yokosi. I will start by uh, you know, mentioning that uh, a number of uh, empirical studies have documented the importance of uh, colonial and present day transportation technologies for economic development in a variety of cities. Um, some of, uh, most of these papers that uh, you are seeing here were mentioned yesterday by Elias in his fascinating lecture. A large majority of these papers document uh, the average effect of colonial uh, transportation technologies. In our paper, we address questions about average and heterogeneous effects of colonial railroads that remain uh, understudied or underexplored in the literature. So before uh, getting into the details of our paper, I would like to uh, provide some historical background on you know, colonial investment in African railroads. Just to mention that by the end of the, the 19th century, railroads in Africa were largely non-existent. However, this situation changed with colonization. As uh, Europeans heavily invested in the construction of uh, railways. European investment in African railways were extensive, accounting for approximately one third of colonial budgets on average. The construction of these railways was largely motivated by a desire to exploit agricultural and mineral rich areas and control the interior of the regions of African colonies. <clears throat> also, um, because the European strategy was to extract cash crops and minerals, colonial railroads typically connected ports with uh, resource rich regions uh, of the interior. Railway construction took place in uh, a diversity of geographic and uh, technological context. However, we still know very little about how these contexts matter for the long-term impact of uh, colonial railway in, in Nigeria, uh, in Africa in general. So what do we do in this paper? In this paper, we use a variety of identification strategies to uncover the short-term, medium-term, and long-term effects of colonial railroads on economic development in Nigeria. In this presentation, I will be focusing on the long-term impacts that is in the interest of time. And, and I will be uh, showing results of uh, the long-term effects of colonial railroads on uh, key outcomes such as uh, education, media access, wealth, and urbanization. We also analyze the heterogeneous effects of uh, the colonial railway by region and by pre-railway access to export markets. We ask the following question, how does access to pre-railway transportation technologies affect the impact of railway in Nigeria. Specifically, we analyze impact of the railway between Nigeria's North and South. This is justified on the ground that the North and South of Nigeria differed in many respects before the introduction of the railway, especially with regard to their level of access to export markets. Specifically, the, the South had been trading with Europe for centuries through the transatlantic slave trade period and the palm arm trade, which replaced it afterwards. By contrast, pre-colonial export trade in most of Northern Nigeria was directed towards trans-Saharan trade to Tripoli, for instance, okay? So these two regions of Nigeria differ significantly before the introduction of 
the railway. And uh, I will also be exploring some possible mechanisms that explain the long-term effects of uh, colonial railways on economic development in Nigeria. And I will be showing two main mechanisms. The first mechanism is, uh, is uh, that the railway affected the, the relative cost of transportation. And uh, the second mechanism uh, shows that, um, that there were differential adoption rates of railway in Northern versus Southern Nigeria. So I will now give a bit of uh, historical background on transportation technologies in pre-colonial and colonial Nigeria. Uh, the construction of the railway lines largely uh, occurred between uh, 1895 and 1935. <clears throat> However, by the 1970s, the use of Nigeria's railroads had declined significantly. Before the railways, uh, transportation of goods was done through head portage, bicycles, animals, cart, and uh, inland waterways. In particular, in the north, there were caravan routes going through Timbuktu to major agglomerations, such as Kano and Sokoto, and onto to North Africa, Cairo and Tripoli, for, for example. In the south, the most important uh, Transportation mode for good before the advent of railways were inland waterways. So, what was uh, the, the big motivation for railway construction in Nigeria? As uh, this uh, a quote from the colonial report of uh, Northern Nigeria reads, so vast an area as Nigeria comprising in all some 380,000 square miles cannot be commercially developed except by railways. So the big motivation here was to extract resources, to link the interior of the, of the colony to parts of export. So railways were primarily built to facilitate the export of agricultural products. And also it was expected that the railway would divert the greater proportion of trade in Northern Nigeria. And before the introduction of the railway, as I mentioned, uh, that trade was being directed to, uh, to North Africa. So these, these are the railways, these are the colonial railways uh, in, in Nigeria. Now, the construction of uh, Nigeria's colonial railways occur in three main stages. And the different stages are sort of illustrated using different colors on this figure in this map. Uh, the phase one, phase one basically consisted of initial penetration lines, which is uh, represented by uh, the black hole. And the second phase consisted of linking interior to ports, which is uh, <clears throat> represented by, uh, by the purple color and uh, and the last phase consisted of branch lines and extensions represented by the yellow color, basically. And the third phase, some of the third phase occur after independence, actually. And uh, these are the different lines and their motivation. And as uh, we can see, uh, The, the, the main motivation here was, was commercial, you know, uh, and, and except for, 
for the, the, the Zakaria Joss Bukaru and uh, Kaduna Kafanshan lines, uh, all, all, all lines were constructed for, for agricultural and mineral purposes. So what are the immediate impacts of the immediate historical impacts of railways? Uh, so the railways in Nigeria had immediate impacts as uh, illustrated, for instance, in this citation. In the Northern province, the history of export cotton production like that of granite has been closely linked with the history of railway expansion. And it was not until the railway reached Kano in 1912 that the export cotton production attained any importance. So, and this image, for instance, uh, is a historical image of groundnut pyramids at a railway near Kano. It was taken during the colonial period. The image underlines the increase in agricultural production, which occurred in northern Nigeria after the introduction of the railway. And here again, the image on the left depicts granite pyramids next a locomotive. Um, and the image on the right was taken in 1924 and depicts barrels and palm oil K awaiting shipping. So the image highlights the importance of waterways for trade and transportation in Southern Nigeria, even after the, con the construction of the railway or as the construction of, of the railway was, was going on. So, <clears throat> so here we can clearly see that, uh, that the railways had a clear impact in the North but little impact in the South. And this is uh, something that we will, I will show in a few minutes with, with data. Now talking about uh, the data, we study the, the, the long run effect of the railway using uh, various data sources. We combine individual and household level data from the demographic and health survey conducted in 2008 in Nigeria with data on colonial railways and other transportation technologies. We also add data on historical missions, uh, data on historical cities and urban locations, and information on geographic conditions and natural environments. We uh, use several identification strategies to uh, document the causal impact of colonial railways in Nigeria. Now, since the railways were constructed in order to connect large areas suitable for agricultural and mineral exploitation to the coast, connected and unconnected areas may differ in many economically relevant pre-railway characteristics. As such, comparing them does not necessarily yield the causal effect of the railway. So we use three main strategies to deal with this possible endogeneity problem. The first strategy that we use is uh, a state fixed effect approach that compares connected and unconnected localities within the states. The second strategy, uh, in the second strategy, we conduct a two-stage least square analysis. That is, we, we, we have an, an instrumental variable for, um, for for connection to, to the railway. And, the final, and in the final strategy, we compare localities close to railway lines to localities close to proposed and planned lines that were not built. These lines are called placebo lines. And um, in the interest of uh, time, I will spend a bit, uh, a, a few minutes on the third strategy because uh, uh, our readers tend to like that strategy better. And, um, but the explanation of the two other strategies is provided in the presentation that, uh, that perhaps is even already posted online for those who are interested. So we 
use placebo lines to test whether the, the effect we measure are due to the railway or merely been close to lines joining nodes that could have been linked by the railway or any other transportation technology. Placebo lines that were extensively surveyed are lines that were extensively surveyed and proposed for railway construction but were never actually constructed. The data on these lines comes from uh, three volumes of, uh, of books written by J. Kell in 1997. And um, the, the, the reason the placebo lines were not constructed uh, can be classified as in, 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 in three main groups. There were idiosyncratic factors such as disagreement between expert, uh, the First World War, uh, a lack of knowledge of the country. And the second reason was uh, budget constraints. And the third reason was uh, terrain conditions, basically. And um, so because the, the third reason is likely to, to affect our outcomes, we actually control for terrain conditions um, and many other geographic endowments and natural endowments uh, in, in our analysis. So these, these lines here are, are the placebo lines. Okay. And in our strategy, we compare the outcomes of those individuals who live within 20 kilometers of an actual line to the outcomes of those individuals who live within 20 kilometers of the placebo line. <clears throat> And um, this, this is our main result. The results show a significant economic effect of the railway when using uh, placebo lines as control. For all dependent variables, which are schooling, reading newspaper, wealth index, living in an urban area, we see an effect that is, uh, that, that is economically and statistically significant. <clears throat> so, and these results are very consistent with uh, the results obtained using uh, a state fixed effect and, 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 and IV. Now, we, I would like to, to, to talk about heterogeneity in the long run impact of colonial railways in Nigeria. And again, we ask this question, how does the long-term effect of colonial railways depend on pre-railway access to viable transportation technologies and port of export? To answer this question, we analyze how the long-term impact of colonial railways differ between Southern and Northern Nigeria. <clears throat> so here, Southern Nigeria is the shaded uh, portion of this figure. And the non-shaded portion is Northern Nigeria. So again, uh, both before and after the introduction of railways, goods in Southern Nigeria <clears throat> in this part could be shipped to major coastal ports through the many rivers and creeks which traverse Nigeria's coastal plains. By contrast, in the north, prior to the introduction of the railways, there were no viable trans, uh, trade routes connecting northern Nigeria to the coast. Goods from the north could not be shipped to port over waterways as the rivers are navigable only for part of the year and for a fraction of the distance 
recovered. As a result, trade in the North was largely oriented towards the Trans-Saharan trade routes prior to the introduction of the railways. <clears throat> and um, now, so we analyze the long-term impact of colonial railways separately for Northern and Southern Nigeria. So for Northern Nigeria, we find a very significant impact of the railway on each of the outcomes that we analyze. For Southern Nigeria, there's no impact at all. You know, the, the effect of on schooling is even negative. And um, the effect on the other outcomes, reading papers, wealth index, and urban, and living in an urban area is not significant at all. It is close to zero. And we have the same patterns with uh, urbanization. The effect of colonial railways on the presence of a city in 2010 is significantly positive in the north of Nigeria, but there is no effect at all in the south. And this is the case even when we, con even when we control for the presence of city in 1960. So now uh, moving to, you know, here we sort of try to understand why uh, the effect was present in, only in the North. And so again, there are two main, we uncovered two main explanations. Um, we present evidence suggesting that railroads were not at all needed in the South because of the existence of other viable transportation technologies, which enable tra trade with Europe. Whereas in the North, railway was needed, actually. And um, we, and, and, and to see the relative importance of the railway in the North and South, we perform in this table, a back of the envelope calculation of the net benefit of shipping agricultural goods by railway relative to other means such as waterways and, and roads, which were the two other modes of transportation available in colonial Nigeria. The calculation is, uh, is done over the period 1945, 1949 for each of the key regional crops, granites and cotton in the North and palm oil and cocoa in the South. And uh, the results are shown in this table. What we find is that we, we estimate the cost reduction from shipping granites and cotton by railway rather than by river in the North to be uh, 1.4% and 51% respective. So cost reduction was quite huge. And the equivalent cost reduction for railing these goods instead of shipping them by road was 65%. Uh, that is for groundnuts and 75% for, for cotton. In comparison, uh, railing palm oil and cocoa instead of shipping them by river would increase their cost by 119%, that is for, co for cocoa that is for palm oil and 60% for, for cocoa. So there weren't any real incentives to adopt, uh, to adopt railway in the South, but there was a clear incentive to adopt railway in the North. And um, this quote from the colonial report of Northern Nigeria is evidence of, of the fact that, that railway lowered the transportation costs in the north. Again, um, it is only after the introduction of uh, of the railway that uh, that that the export of 
of cotton and, and groundnut exploded in the north. And also, this figure shows the adoption rates of, uh, of key northern and, and southern crops. And as we can see, railway was highly adopted to export groundnuts and cotton, but exporting uh, palm kernel, palm oil, and cocoa, which are southern crops, um, was not primarily done through, her, through, through, through the railways. And um, we, we conduct several robustness checks to, to confirm all the results that, that I show you here. And um, so in conclusion, we find that our countrywide analysis indicates that on average proximity to colonial, to colonial rel, rel line has a significant positive impact on local development in Nigeria. However, uh, further analysis reveals that uh, this effect is concentrated in the north of Nigeria and is largely absent in the south. We find that connected areas in the north were transformed by the railway, not only in the long run, but also in the short run. I didn't have the time to show the results for the short run. And um, the railways actually altered the pre-railway trade equilibrium only in the north. And um, the south had cheaper pre-existing alternatives to, uh, to rail transport. So, um, we also believe that, uh, that this study has uh, some pure implication for the long-term impact of, of history. Uh, clearly, the impact of history is not homogeneous, even within countries. There are some factors that could even amplify or diminish the impact of, of history in the long run. Thank you very much. And now I, I would like to, uh, to invite Belinda to, uh, to the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Roland, Dr. Pongu. Uh, let me share my slides very quickly so that you can all see. Let's see, I'm going to make this full screen. And, all right, so hopefully everybody can see this. Yes, we can. Yes, Thank okay. you. excellent. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to set my timer for around 25 minutes just in case, uh, since I'm told we have about 20 to 25 minutes. But thank you again, Elias, uh, Leonard, uh, Messe, everyone for planning uh, and investing time in this. I think this is a great series. And thank you for inviting me to, to talk about this paper. So this paper is joint work with uh, my colleague, Nonso Bikili, who's currently at the UN. And so I'm going to tell you about prison labor and why it's important to both African economic development in the past, and I would argue just general economic development and thinking about economic policy today as well, right? So, You've heard a lot about colonial infrastructure, right? So, so uh, Roland had that excellent paper with uh, Dozier and co-authors uh, thinking about the railway and the effects of the railway uh, on economic development in Nigeria. Uh, and, and Elias also gave this presentation on, you know, in a nice outline presentation on thinking about the railway and the effects of the railway uh, on economic development in colonial Africa as well, and also current development in Africa. So one of the questions that arises from this literature, right? So I'm a development econo economist, as Elias mentioned. We study a lot of, of, of this kind of thinking about the effects of past events, so long run development on current development outcomes. And one of the things that comes out when you look at this literature, right, is like you, you hear about, well, if you had the, the railway in uh, 20th century in Nigeria, or if you had uh, missionary schools, right, back way back in the early 20th century or late 19th century in Africa, you have these uh, you know, positive, 
current economic development outcomes today. Uh, and a big question that's lurking in this background is who built the railway, right? This is the shorthand for this. Who built the railway? Who built the missionary schools? So if you look at these pictures, I'm just pictures that I pulled from archives when thinking about the colonial railway in Africa and also missionary schools in Africa, right? It is not white Europeans that are building the railway. So it's not these people up here. It's not the people, some of the people pictured here. It is often or frequently, almost always, native African labor that's involved in building the railway, building the missionary schools, building a lot of these key infrastructure that we've identified in the past as being important for economic development, and also currently as being important for economic development, right? And frequently, a lot of these people were not paid, right? So, so African forced labor was an essential part of building a lot of these key colonial infrastructure, like the railway, like the schools, et cetera, right? And particularly within forced labor, right? I'll talk about what this, this forced labor com consisted of, unpaid workers. Uh, prison labor, the labor of incarcerated people, was also very, very key in building a lot of these big ticket, important, as, as uh, Dr. Pongu just mentioned, for economic development outcomes like the railway, right? So we'll talk about that as well. So, so keep that idea, keep that question in mind as we, as we go over this. Who built the railway? It is native African labor, it's forced African labor a lot of the time. A lot of the time it is African prisoners that are doing this. Okay, another motivation for why we want to think about prison labor and study prison labor also from a contemporary point of view is that a lot of countries around the world have identified that, look, we are incarcerating more and more people, right? So this is looking at many different countries around the world from 1950 to today and looking at rise like incarceration trends and, and, and trends in incarceration rates, right? And, and if you look at this, you see that you have rising incarceration rates the trends point to more and more prisoners, more and more people being incarcerated around the world, right? If you look at the statistics, we have more people incarcerated today, 11 million people incarcerated in the world than at any other point in human history. And so a lot of governments have looked at this picture and said, hey, what do we do about all of these incarcerated people? Well, we should use them for free labor, right? And, and so they're, they're, they're like, this is from 2018, uh, President uh, Mag Magafuli in Tanzania said, you know, let's use prisoners for free labor. Uh, in the U.S., a, a, a sheriff in one of the states of the U.S. also mentioned this, using prisoners for free labor. Um, China uses for prisoners for free labor. Many countries are either using prisoners for free labor or suggesting that we use prisoners for free labor. So as an economist, we said, okay, let's step back. Or as economists, Donso and I are economists, we said, let's step back and think very carefully also about the kind of incentive effects that can arise when you use um, an institution of, like ostensibly an institution of justice, like prisons, to serve economic interests. You are using these prisoners, and your, mate, your main motive for using these prisoners is to use their labor. What does that do to the incentive to incarcerate people? And so we wanted to ask, uh, ask and answer this question. And also, you know, this is something that has been, uh, you know, this kind of issues around trust in police, trust in the legal institutions around the world, have really been at the heart of a lot of protests that have been happening um, in Nigeria. You know, the NSARS protests against police brutality. In the US, certainly with the Black Lives Matter movement that, that started in the US, but around the world, thinking about you know, what affects people's trust in police, what affects people's trust in their legal institutions. If you are in a situation where, again, you're, you're, you know, right, or you experience that like your government is using this ostensibly instrument of justice like prisons to serve economic interests primarily, or, or what we are calling extrajudicial interests. How does that affect your trust in your courts, your trust in your police, your trust in your legal institutions more generally? Or to state it a different way, how does that affect how you view the legitimacy of your state? Right? And this is a very important question, again, because if you don't view your state as legitimate, it can lead to more protests, it can lead to uh, a, very you know, a lot of difficulty in enforcing contracts. All of these things that we know in economics are important for economic development. Right? So, so this is another question that we, we wanted to see if we could answer uh, thinking about the effects of past prison labor. On, or on, on, on current kind of trust in legal institutions as well. So we're gonna try and answer all these questions I just, I just told you and I just mentioned to you using evidence from Nigeria, right? So, so I don't, I guess we've, we've gone over the history extensively already. So I don't think I need to explain to this audience, but just in case, Nigeria is a British colony officially um, from around 1914 to 1960. So what we did is go into archival material and digitize a lot of information around prisons, around public finance, et cetera, in Nigeria, almost all of the colonial period, right, from around 1920 to 1959. So this is a very important period in Nigerian, or, or not even just Nigerian history, but in colonial history, more generally in Africa, because this is a period where you have prison labor is by law a feature of the way the state is financing its public works projects, the way the state is financing its road construction, its railroad construction, et cetera. 
right? And it's explicitly by law, a feature of how the state is, is financing these, these public works. And also, you know, by in practice, this is how the state is, is an important part of how the state is, is, is kind of financing uh, uh, these, these, the construction of these, these key public works that, that Roland mentioned as being very important for economic development and also well, colonial extraction, really. So we're going to think about this period, you know, where prison labor is explicitly a feature of state policy, of state financing. Uh, and this is again a period where uh, all the prisoners must work by law. They are completely unpaid, unpaid labor, and they are only allowed to work on government projects like the railway. Okay. So we're going to look at this period. We're going to compare it to another period in Nigeria where you don't have uh, prison labor as a major motive for incarceration. The post-colonial period, so Nigeria gets independence from the British in around 1960. And so we're going to gather also data from around 1970 to 1995. So altogether, we had an extensive data set that we put together over a number of years of 65 years of archival data from 1920 to 1995 on prisons, on taxation, on all of these things that we're going to use to understand the role of prison labor for these like colonial public works construction. And so we're going to try and answer these, these three key questions. I, I kind of mentioned to you earlier, but I, let me give you the brief overview of the paper and then we can go a little bit more leisurely. So one, given that a lot of historians, right, have identified that prisoners, especially in prison labor, African prison labor was key for colonial public works construction. Can we think about, or can we put a, a kind of quantitative estimate, even if it's a, what we call in economics, a lower bound, so it's given the lower end of the range, uh, quantitative estimates on, on, on what, how important was prison labor for colonial public finance, and uh, works construction, again, under the system where uh, the prisoners are all unpaid, right? Uh, and, uh, and then going back to this question of how then does, does this affect your incentive to incarcerate people when you have prison labor as a major part of your state policy and as a major motive for incarcerating people, right? So then we're, we're gonna answer and answer this question by saying, how did incarceration rates respond to economic shocks, right? So these like sudden changes in the economic condition in the country that, for example, in the colonial period might increase the colonial government's demand for more labor all of a sudden, right? Under this system where prison labor is important to state public finance. And then as a falsification test, just to see, you know, how things change, how the relationship between economic shocks or economic conditions and uh, incarceration rates change under a prison labor system and a non-prison labor system. I'm also going to show you evidence from post-colonial Nigeria where you don't have that same prison labor motive as a major uh, a reason for why the state is incarcerating people. This has to do with the change in the economic condition of Nigeria. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a few minutes, but, but we can then look at uh, you know, how does incarceration respond to economic shocks under a prison labor system, colonial Nigeria, versus a non-prison labor system, post-colonial Nigeria uh, as well. And then lastly, I'm going to show you some suggested evidence on this trust in legal institutions uh, uh, outcome that I mentioned before, right? So what are the long-term effects of these type of prison labor systems on people's views of the legitimacy of their state, on things like their trust in legal institutions, trust in police, trust in courts, et cetera, again, that are important for the functioning of a government and important for, for economic development. We know this as economists uh, more generally as well. When these institutions, I keep saying this again, these ostensibly institutions of justice are used to serve economic or extrajudicial interests uh, in this context. All right. I don't think I need to motivate why it's important to study colonial Nigeria in this course, but you know, sometimes we, we have to say this when we're talking to more general audiences. I am Nigerian. I think everyone wants to study Nigeria just by virtue of being Nigerian. But just in case you're wondering why we think colonial Nigeria is an informative region to study these questions, um, if you look at the top 40 countries in terms of incarceration to, uh, as of 2018, so let's say roughly today, of course, the US is number one, incarcerates the most people in the world. But if you put colonial Nigeria, so Nigeria in around 1940 on this map, it would be this red line here, right? So Nigeria in 1940, colonial Nigeria was in cars, would have ranked around 15 of 222 countries. So relatively, you know, the British are basically incarcerating a relatively high share of, of Nigerians um, uh, uh, over this period. If you look at Nigeria today, so this is called incarceration rates in Nigeria as of 2018 you can see the stark reversal in trends, right? So Nigeria today incarcerates a much smaller share of its population. I think it would rank around 211 of 222 countries in the world today. So, so we can use this period, relatively high incarceration versus relatively low incarceration, and the stark change between the two to really understand, again, this, these dynamics and answer these questions that I mentioned before. All right, so let me tell you the results, and again, then we'll go more leisurely uh, uh, through the paper. So one, remember that first question I said, look, Given that a lot of the historians have mentioned that prison labor was very, very important for constructing things like the railway, or constructing the roads, these key infrastructure that were important for, you know, colonial revenue raising, if you will, or colonial extraction. 
how then, how, how can we put a number on how valuable this was to the colonial regime? So again, this is under a system where all able-bodied prisoners, if you're able-bodied, you must work by law and you are completely unpaid. So once we do this, we can say, you know, what is the value of that of unpaid wages to these people, given that they were unpaid, right? So let's take a lower bound estimate of the value of unpaid wages to these people. And once we do that, we find that, of course, the gross value of prison labor is strictly positive over the whole period. And then, of course, you can think, well, these people, when they're being fed, um, you have their costs associating with keeping people in prison, right? So you feed them, you clothe them, you have to build the prison. What about the salaries of the prison guards, et cetera? So think of all of the costs you can imagine, or at least you can think that would be recorded in uh, maintaining a prisoner. We can then say, OK, when you subtract out those costs, is it still, on average, lower bound estimate again, valuable uh, from a quantitative point of view to, to incarcerate these people for their labor? And we find that the answer is yes, right? So the net value of prison labor minus all these costs of maintaining your prisoner is strictly positive in most of the years of the colonial period in Nigeria. Right? And so we can do things like compare it to how much the British were spending on, on this big ticket infrastructure like the railway. Uh, and again, it, it's a significant share, uh, economic share of you know, how much the expenditures, how much the British were spending on things like the railway. Right? So, so, so prison labor is quite valuable, very valuable to the colonial regime. But the second question I mentioned before was to say, well, then if you know that prison labor is a valuable thing for building your railway, for building your roads, when you need labor to build these things, right? So during a period of an economic shock, right? Say, say all of a sudden you have a positive economic shock that increases the demand for labor. So the, the, the colonial officials all of a sudden need more labor. They don't have enough labor. How does this affect incarceration of people? So we find that during these periods of, of positive economic shock, so think of this as like, uh, you're an African farmer, this is a good rainfall year, for example, is one, one way we measure this, right? So it's a good rainfall year that increases the agricultural productivity of your yields. It's supposed to be a good year for you. What we see is that during these periods, you actually see an increase in the incarceration rates of, of, of Africans, right? It, using this data from Korea, Nigeria, right? And we can measure this in many ways. We can also look at the export prices of these cash crops that, that we long mentioned earlier, palm oil, cocoa, uh, et cetera. And we see something very similar. When you have higher prices, coming in from your palm oil exports, you also see an increase in the incarceration of Nigerians in, in, in this region, right? And so why is this happening? Again, men, a couple of big reasons. One, you have this period where you have a lot of labor scarcity, maybe as they mentioned in previous lectures. And so when you are a colonial government that is trying to maximize your revenues, you're trying to minimize your cost of administration, you don't wanna pay people to work, right? Because this is costly for you. So part of the minimizing the cost of administration was that they would have these wage ceilings in the public work sector that then further exacerbated the labor shortages during these good years where people would rather work on their farms and get higher incomes than work for these lower paid like railway jobs, right? So what do you do? One of the things you can do to satisfy your increased demand for labor as the British colonial official is to incarcerate more people. And there are many ways to do this. Like one way is to say you are actually incarcerating more people. One way is to say, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, you are switching the punishment for the crimes. And I'll talk about what kind of crimes that we're talking about, we're talking about as well, right? So instead of fining people for loitering, for example, you are putting them in prison in periods where you need more labor. Also, these are periods where, again, you're getting higher cash crop prices for your palm oil. You want to get these palm oil exports out to the coast more, much more quickly for, 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 for revenue. You need your, your railway up and running to do this. And so what do you do? You push forward the timing of construction on these, these big ticket railway road, et cetera, items. And, and to do that, you need more labor, you get more prisoners. So this is what we find, this very odd result that good economic years actually increased the incarceration of Africans during the colonial period under this, this system of prison labor. So if you look at the post-colonial period, again, where you don't have a, a, a system of prison labor, you see that the sign completely switches, right? So now, instead of good economic years increasing the incarceration rates, bad economic years, so negative economic shocks actually increasing the incarceration rates, much more in line with a lot of the things we see in like the crime literature, where people are being incarcerated more because you know, of, of, of kind of economic crimes like theft and steal, you know, stealing theft, et cetera. Uh, so, so, so just showing you again how the dynamics change under a prison labor system versus a non-prison labor system uh, as well. And then lastly, I will show you some suggestive evidence as I mentioned that if you look at respondents in Nigeria today from areas with high rates of colonial imprisonment, you see that they, they report much lower trust in their legal institutions, especially things like trust in police today. So there's no effect on, on I think, uh, 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 Dr. Nunn, Nathan Nunn, maybe talked about the slave trade and trust earlier, but no effect on the things that, that like, like interpersonal trust, things that, that have been shown 
to be affected by long run uh, processes like the slave trade, right? Trusting your neighbors, etc. Only really coming from these trust in legal institutions uh, and reduction in trust in legal institutions uh, from, from, from these systems. All right, so I've told you the whole paper. So now this is our, our classic economics uh, uh, strategies. Then we can now go leisurely now that you've seen the whole, the whole paper and the whole results. So let me tell you a little bit more about the history of this background right, in the last eight minutes. So when we talk about prison labor, prison labor is just one small part of a very, very large regime of domestic forced labor that is occurring in colonial Africa. As I said, I showed you that picture earlier. Who's building the railway? Who is building the schools, et cetera? A lot of it is being built using forced African labor. So why? So I will go over this, I think uh, speakers before and Dr. Pongu mentioned this earlier, but you have this kind of European colonial revenue imperative. They are trying to maximize revenues from, from agricultural exports while minimizing the cost of administration. And they are facing severe labor shortages for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So what do they do to satisfy this? They, they, they have a lot of kind of coercive laws that are put in place, um, things like labor ordinances, uh, labor taxes that basically said that African men in particular had to donate free weeks of labor or months of labor to work on the railway, uh, masters and servants ordinance that make it very hard to quit your job, vagrancy laws, which I think are self-explanatory. If you're seen loitering or being a vagrant, you can be arrested or you can be fined. And again, if you don't participate in these laws, what happens? You can be fined, you have to pay a fine to the colonial regime, or they put you in prison and then they can use your labor anyway for free, right? So just to show you how kind of com uh, maybe the complex this system was. Okay, so, and just to show you again, this is not, I, I'm gonna tell you evidence from Nigeria, but this is happening across, I would say the European colonies more generally, right? So I, we can identify this across British colonial Africa. I have colleagues that have done this. Marlies Van Weijenberg has done this in French West Africa as well. Uh, and, and you can basically see that, you know, if you look at, how people are being punished for crimes as defined by the colonial regime. Africans, so this is from Kenya in 1931 and 1938, Africans are disproportionately given prison, right? Compared to, for example, Asians or Europeans in Kenya. So it's just to show you how, how kind of stark and how you know, you know, used prison is as, as, a, as a form of punishment also for, for Africans across British colonial Africa. All right, so if you look at Nigeria, let's talk about Nigeria in particular. So I, you, as I said, Nigeria is a colony from around 1914 to 1960 officially. Uh, as a single amalgamated entity. Uh, we're going to show you evidence from colonial prisons. So these are the prisons directly run by British colonial officials. Most of the prisoners are there for these like short-term sentences, so less than six months, right? So they're not there for long-term sentences that are greater than two years. Um, about 88% of the people in the, that we see in prison are there for less than six months. Why are they putting people in prison? They want to punish crime. They want to control the African population. And very, very importantly, they want to get cheap labor. Right. They state this by law. Stated, I'll show you where they state this explicitly in the communal archives as well. Right. And again, remember, unpaid labor, all Africans must work if you're able-bodied, and you can only work for government. So you cannot work for private sector in this case. What about crime? So we don't have detailed data on crime, but I can show you the kind of crimes that Africans are being convicted for in the colonial period and in the post-colonial period in Nigeria. Right. So if you look at the, the kind of crimes Africans are being con uh, convicted for between 1920 and 1940 in Nigeria, you see that the majority of crimes, so this is around 60% of crimes on average, are this blue line. What is this blue line? So this blue line is called the Offenses Against Revenue, Road, Social Economy, Colony Laws. So remember what I mentioned about the vagrancy, the loitering, you know, the, the violation of the lead masses and servants, that is this category. So this, this, this is not property theft, which is offenses against property, the green line. This is not assault or murder, which is the purple line down here. So most Africans are being incarcerated for these crimes, these like offenses against road social economy laws over this period. If you look at post-colonial Nigeria, so this is between 1977 and 1993, you see that a very, very different picture, right? So on average, the majority of crimes people are being incarcerated for in post-colonial Nigeria is offenses against property or property theft. So just to show you already, you can see something very different is going on in the reason that the, the people are being incarcerated between the colonial period and the post-colonial period. So I won't go over this in too much detail, but just to show you again, you know, there, 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 a, lot of, a lot of big ticket items in Nigeria, big ticket public works items in Nigeria are built using prison labor. So people who know Nigeria, this is Southeast Nigeria, Belkuta province, Enu, Enugu, Potakot, uh, quarries, coal fields, the railway from Potakot to Enugu that uh, Dr. Pongu identified is built almost entirely using large kinds of prison labor. So big key infrastructure are, used, are built using prison labor uh, over this time. 
I mentioned that in post colonial Nigeria, you don't have prison labor as a big feature of, of, of a motive for incarceration. Why is that? In Nigeria they discovers oil around 1956. Uh, there is an oil price boom in the 70s. And so basically government doesn't need the railway, et cetera, for agricultural exports from the interior to the coast anymore. Most of government revenue switches from agricultural commodity exports to the green and blue lines, which is oil, right? Petroleum revenue. Okay, let me show you this. This is a wall of text, don't worry, but let me just highlight one text just to show you again, we're not making this up in the data. This is something that is explicitly stated in the qualitative archives as well. So, so in 1923, uh, the British sanitary inspector writes to the governor of Nigeria to ask for more uh, wait, some more money to hire, hire people, hire wage labor to work uh, on, on their, their public works. So the, the, the officials asked the prison department to find, so the official, the government, the governor writes back and the officials asked the prison department to find ways to either increase the pop prison population or recruit convicts from outstation prisons to complete the task. Again, it's not hidden. It's not something we're making up in the data. It is explicitly stated in the qualitative archives by the officials themselves that this is what they're doing, using prisoners for their labor or getting people to be prisoners for their labor. Um, okay, last two minutes. Let me just tell you a bit about the data. So, so we're using this data from the colonial, uh, it's called the Blue Books, it's accessible online, people are interested in this. Uh, and we're also using the annual report on prisons from 1920 to 1959. This is Nigeria. I think you just saw it. So everybody knows what Nigeria looks like. You saw it in Dr. Pongu's presentation. And, and just to highlight, these are the colonial prisons in red. So there are more of them in the south. This is the south of Nigeria than in the north. That is also because you have more productive cash crops in the south. So they seem to be strategically locating the prisons as well for where you, know, you can use them for, for work on, on these like roads and railroad to export these, these uh, uh, commodities and cultural commodities to the coast for export. This is the colonial, this is the, the railway, the colonial railway in Nigeria. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but I, I can show you some stats earlier uh, later if we have time. But a lot of the prisons are almost strategically, it seems, right? Anyway, I'm just gonna making no, no strong causal statements here, but very interesting. They're they're located along the railway or clustered along the railway. If I put a road density map of Nigeria on here, you would also see the same, very similar thing that the prisons are located almost at the centers of these clusters of road density networks. So again, just highlighting this, it seems like they are strategically locating the, 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 the prisons with proximity to the, the, these public works infrastructure that, that need labor as well. All right, so I'm gonna skip over this. As I mentioned, one of the things we did was to say, you know, how valuable is this, this uh, prison labor given that prisoners are unpaid? Um, and, and then what are the costs of maintaining your prisoner? So then you can see that if you look at the prison costs, so this is the total prison costs um, in red. If you look at the value of prison of, of, of unpaid wages to prisoners using the wage in blue, essentially the blue line is above the red line in most of the colonial period here, right? So the net value of prison labor is positive in most of the colonial period. Um, so second question, I know I'm running out of time, but just to kind of quickly highlight what I mentioned in the, in the opening, Again, we wanted to understand if prison labor is so important, how do, when you have a, a sudden need for labor, how do these positive economic shocks or positive productivity shocks, positive labor demand shocks from the colonial government affect their incentive to incarcerate more people? And the, the answer is it does. So this is just showing again, we're gonna look at this period from 1920 to 1940 in Nigeria. You have relatively high incarceration rates, kind of falls after 1940, rises right before independence. And then we don't have data here, civil war, and then this is post-colonial Nigeria incarceration rates. You can see it's much lower, right, than the colonial period. So, so in, in average incarceration rates are falling by almost, what is it, 40% between the colonial period and the post-colonial period here. And just to show you again, this is just showing how strange this looks, right? So you see this relatively high level of incarceration in southern Nigeria in the colonial period. This is from 1920, but if I showed you Nigeria in every year, it looks like this. Post-colonial Nigeria, this is from 1980 much more dispersed incarceration rates uh, around the country. Uh, and again, very strange placement in the in colonial Nigeria, except you somehow think that, you know, Southern Nigerians are, are somehow more crime prone. Um, this is a very strange thing to see. I don't think that I'm also from Southern Nigeria, so I'd be a little bit biased, but, you know, very, very strange picture to see in colonial Nigeria. So I'm gonna skip over all of this just in the interest of time. These are the, the, the results that I showed you before, so I won't go over this, this result. It's, again, very strange results that positive economic shocks increase incarceration rates, especially short-term incarceration rates. Um, these like people that are in prison for these short periods of time for less than six months in the colonial period. And you see this regardless of the model you use, prices or rainfall. Um, and then lastly, we can do this on trust um, and, and think about you know, when your first exposure to the colonial 
or to the legal system, right, which is true for a lot of Africans, is through at least the legal system in terms of police, in terms of courts, the modern courts that we have today, is through this colonial system. How does that affect your current trust in courts? How does that affect your current trust in police or in, in tax administration? Uh, and the answer, as I mentioned before, is that it, it, it seems to be associated with lower trust in police, lower trust in courts, lower trust in tax administration, no effect or no association with your trust in your neighbors, your trust in your, your relatives, and your trust in the elected government, uh, local government council. So also, you know, I have a student on this who's working on thinking about policing and how colonial policing has affected modern day trust, very, very important things to study right now, especially in the context of a lot of the conflict and protests happening. Uh, but just to conclude, I know I've run out of time, we started out this question, like who built the colonial infrastructure that we've been talking about? It was built by Africans. It was built often by forced African labor, um, built often by prison labor. And really we should place that in perspective is what we were arguing when we think about these long run colonial development studies, right? So thinking about the, the economics, we use this, this term general equilibrium effects, but thinking about the overall effect, if you will, um, of, of, of these colonial infrastructure, especially with this consideration that they are built using unpaid often forced African labor, right? And forced African prison labor. Um, and, and so we have these results that we are hoping will inform also not just the, the history, people studying the history of, of, of African development, but also people studying current policies around prison labor, right? Especially since I gave you that slide at the beginning, a lot of governments have been suggesting that we use uh, prisoners and we use prison, you know, prisoners for their free labor. <laughs> and so we like to take a step back, think very carefully about how in the past that has affected incentives. Of course, prison systems today are very different from colonial prison systems in the past. Uh, but there are definitely, you know, kind of lines to connect in history uh, and, and, and thinking very carefully about the policy implications for, for use of prison labor today uh, as well. All right. Thank you. Definitely run out of time. So thank you very much. And I will pass it on back to, is it LA or, uh, Elias or Bessé? Uh, hi, Belinda and Roland. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, there are a lot of questions in the q and Unfortunately, we won't be able to address all of them, but I've been informed that uh, the teaching team and, and, and others will be able to address your questions and they will be available um, on the website next week. Um, so the kind of, the first question is, is it's something that came up uh, frequently, which is, and it's related to uh, both of your works. There's an important difference in the experiences of the Northern and Southern regions both in terms of the provision of, of public goods and also its effectiveness, was it, when, um, specifically looking at railways. So could you speak to that, you know, both of you? Like what's the role of the pre-colonial institutions in explaining uh, and the patterns that you see? Should I go first, or long? do you want sure. to go first? Okay, so uh, let me, so it's a very good question, right? And, and it's something that I have, I've written papers on thinking about the effects of people in institutions and, and current development outcomes. I, I know I went very fast. <laughs> this is like a very long paper. We tried to go through very fast in 25 minutes. But if you notice, I mentioned that in the North of the country, you see less colonial prisons than in the South of the country, right? There are more of these colonial prisons that are directly administered by the colonial officials in Southern Nigeria than in Northern Nigeria. As, one reason that I mentioned for that is because of the placement of agricultural commodities. You have much more valuable agricultural commodities like palm oil and cocoa in the South that are useful again to have infrastructure close by uh, to extract to the coast. But another reason, another very important reason is that you also have much more stronger pre-colonial institutions in the North of the country. Not much stronger, but, but relatively stronger, I should say, uh, pre-colonial institutions in Northern Nigeria than in Southern Nigeria. And so I didn't mention this in the, in the presentation, but you also have a separate parallel system of prisons called the native administration prisons in Nigeria, mostly in Northern Nigeria that are directly administered by these pre-colonial leaders. So the, the, the centralized chiefs, I think that, that uh, uh, a lot of the scholars that presented have mentioned before, right? So those are, you see that then these, you see these, these different types of prison administration with the native administration prisons more in the North, more kind of directly administered by the pre-colonial leaders. They're still doing very something very, very similar, but, but much more, monitored right and of course you know you can think of what the implications of well, implications are, of that are for, for kind of current or long-run development outcomes the trust outcomes that we mentioned um, but that's definitely something to highlight uh, as well roland would you like to add to that or? no i think we didn't say it all yeah um the other question that also came up frequently was trying to understand um 
the decline in the importance or effectiveness of, of railways uh, over time. So in particular, um, there's a question about why was there little or no transfer of technical know-how from the, the, those who built the railroads to the Africans. And, and perhaps Belinda, you can speak to this in terms of uh, who, were, who was involved in the construction of railroads, uh, both kind of from different aspects of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, let, let, let me go first. I, I, I think that uh, in, in Nigeria, like uh, in uh, many other African countries where colonial railroads, railroads were constructed, um, railroads uh, fell into, into disuse after, you know, shortly after the independence. In the case of Nigeria, for instance, uh, um, the railroads uh, fell into this mice after uh, like in, in the 1970s. Um, and uh, this was related to, uh, to, to, to several, uh, you know, reasons. You, 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 you have mismanagement, uh, lack of maintenance and uh, the adoption of uh, a new transportation uh, technology, which, which is uh, motor roads, okay? And those motor roads were not built close to railroad lines in the case of Nigeria. And um, now uh, it should also be mentioned that, uh, that the, the construction of railroads uh, in, in Nigeria, like in most uh, colonies of Africa was quietly related to European interest. Okay, so, um, you know, after the independence, uh, the European sort of left somehow. And uh, it is quite possible that, uh, that that those interests, you know, were not sustained by the local population. And that's why uh, the, 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 the railroads uh, uh, declined. But one big factor again was that uh, there were alternative trans transportation technologies like in Nigeria. In other countries, it wasn't always the case. In Cameroon, for instance, uh, in, in, in Cameroon, the, the, the railroads uh, were maintained and, and they are still uh, functioning right now. Thank you. Um, kind of related to that is also there are questions about the mismatch of railways and roads. In, in particular, as both of you highlighted, the railroads were typically built to connect uh, areas, mining areas from inland areas or agricultural centers to ports. And that may have resulted in the long run in terms of a mismatch in terms of where railroads are available and where uh, you know, there were clusters of population, particularly the more de developed, uh, developed areas. Um, and similarly, there were questions about mismatches between railroads built by different colonizers. So uh, let's say between the British and French or, or Portuguese. So there was a question about whether that mismatch has had a, a long run effect in hindering connection across countries. Could you speak to that? Yeah, no, it, it, well, it, it is possible that, that the mismatch uh, had you know long term effects. Uh, again, what we find in Nigeria, for instance, is that uh, we 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 still find you know positive effects of railroads in the north, but no effect at all in the south. So even if uh, the 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 railroads were not built in locations that would have maximized uh, the 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 revenue of local populations, okay? Because again, keep in mind that. Uh, that colonizers had their own interest in mind. So the, the location, the current location of railroads sort of maximize colonizers' revenues, colonizers' income, okay? But not that of the local population, but it is sort of interesting that right now, okay, even though the colonizers have left, you know, we can still find, we can still see some positive impact of, of, of the railroad. Now, uh, had the railroads, been constructed, you know, in places where uh, where, where the interest of, uh, of of the local population would be maximized, maybe would have seen even uh, even bigger effects of those railroads. But this is work to be done, I think. Okay. Great. Um, uh, there was also a related question: uh, What was the role of local elites um, in in the process of railroad construction, particularly? The, some of the early, uh, earlier railroads were built before the amalgamation of North and South. Uh, um, maybe Belinda can speak to that. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. So, so this is an interesting, 
it's an interesting question because the, the, the you know, I, I'll give you one answer. There are multiple answers here. So on the one hand, I mentioned, for example, a lot of the, the railway, the road construction was built using forced labor. So I briefly mentioned the labor taxes, right? So, so uh, you know, in, Fran in, in French West Africa, they were called corvée, where I mentioned that you had young African men that had to donate three hours or three weeks or three months of labor. So oftentimes what the British would say, this is part of the indirect rule, is that, well, you know, this isn't slavery because they were very careful to avoid accusations of being engaged in the slave trade because they, they had signed the, the, labor, the, the forced labor convention in, in the 1920s and 1930. And they said, it isn't slavery because there's an existing system of labor taxes or labor donations run by the local elites in these African countries, right? So they, have, they already have these kind of labor donations they do already that they give to the, the local chief to be able to, you know, and so we're just tapping into that to be able to, to run the, the colony. So, so the local elites in, in shorthand are very involved in this process, right? They're very involved indirectly through this, this forced labor process. And they're also very involved directly in Northern Nigeria, as I mentioned, through the administering of the native administration prisons. So both through the labor tax system and through the prison system, especially in Northern Nigeria, the, the local elites are very, very involved in, in getting forced labor often um, and getting uh, prison labor to work on colonial public works. Great. Um, kind of related to that, but on, on the other side, looking at the colonial administrators, uh, one of the, the participants commented that the typical tenure of these colonial administrators were short in, 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 in this part of the, the, the world. Is that common to, is that unique to Nigeria? Is that common across different, different colonies? And how does that affect the incentives for the types of projects that this uh, administrators take in and, and how they implement them? No, another good question. And, and sorry, just to add to my previous point on the local elites, to ensure, to, to make sure again, we have research on this previously. So a lot of this is also being done under coercion from the part of the British colonial government, right? So, so if you disobey as a local elite, you're also punished with you know, lowered investment in your region, um, or you could be punished with exile, et cetera. So this is like, they are, they are doing this under, a lot of them under constraints also that they are facing from British colonial officials. So on the British colonial government officials themselves, so I can tell you from the point of view, I have a colleague, uh, Gozu, who has a very nice paper on, on thinking about colonial bureaucrats and the incentives that they face, especially given their tenure. Um, so I, I, I can speak from the point of view of Nigeria. So if you look at, and from the point of view of prisons in Nigeria, so if you look at the, the prison administration system in Nigeria, you actually see that the directors of prisons who are kind of the head of these systems of, of organizing incarceration and forced labor, they, they have somewhat long tenures, at least from what I can see in the, in the archives, right? So they are there, you know, between 1920 and 1940, there may be four different directors of prisons, just to give you an idea of like what the tenure is like. Um, and so to the extent that at very least in that early part of the 20th century, you have fewer, you have less turnover. There is a somewhat coordinated effort in terms of how they, they organize the laws, how they execute the laws. They work very closely with the courts in terms of deciding um, on, on sentencing. They also work very closely with, uh, in terms of policing, in, terms of, in hiring police, et cetera, uh, uh, you know, around the railway, or like figuring out where to place the police. So at least I can tell you from that early part of the 20th century in, in Nigeria, from like 1920 to 1940, there's, there's less turnover, um, which maybe you say then there's, there's much more continuity. In the latter part of the 20th century, I don't have as much information. They start recording less information after 1940 on, on the state of like, uh, who's, well, I know who's in charge for, for most of the years, but on the state of like the prisons, the policing, et cetera. So I can't tell you too much more around, you know, how that affects continuity in the practicing. There's definitely a change in the rhetoric, I would say, um, towards independence about, well, we don't, we're not really wanting them for, for labor. We're actually like use, we want the prison to be a source or a place of, uh, of uh, re-education of, of these people, right? and the, the rhetoric changes. So how much is that the change in the tenure or just changes in how British, the, the British are, are kind of viewing the, 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 the you know, how much more the colonial empire can last? Um, that's, you know, I can't, uh, that's up for debate. And, and a lot of people who've written on that as well. Yeah, good, great. Um, there was also a related question on, on kind of how the differences in the post-colonial experience across different regions in, in Nigeria 
may have affected uh, both kind of uh, patterns in incarceration as well as the effect the effects of uh, access to rail. So um, perhaps Roland, you can speak to this. Like, have you looked into, for example, the effect of uh, oil discoveries and also conflicts following decolonization? How how those those factors may have shaped um, the effects of, of of access to railroads on on economic development. We, we, we didn't look at that question specifically, but uh, in the analysis, we sort of took into account all production uh, in, 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 in Nigeria. And uh, we didn't find <coughs> all production to, uh, to really affect our results. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether we should be talking about you know how you know access to those uh, or the availability or the production of all for instance uh, affected access to uh, to railroad because again uh, those railroads uh, fell into disuse uh, in 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 the seventies basically I know that in two thousand nine uh, uh, there 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 was uh, a project to rehabilitate uh, those some of those are roads and, and, and I know maybe being that you might correct me, but there's one line now that, uh, that, that, that is functional, but, uh, but colonial railroads are still uh, very much uh, not used. Okay. And, and uh, I was reading the statistics a while ago, uh, the statistics shows that <clears throat> the number of passengers, uh, of railroad passengers fell from something like 11 million in, uh, in 1964, that is uh, after independence, to uh, less than 2 million today. Great. Um, and this is for Belinda. There were also questions about kind of the similarities between the experiences of, of um, the use of convict labor in the US and, and, and in Nigeria. There was a question about how the 13th Amendment, the US was used to essentially lay um, kind of open up the use of convict labor for, for uh, for for uh, you know agricultural production, for example, um, do you have you made that connection, or or how how do you think about that relationship between the experiences of, of you know Nigerians and, and in the U.S.? Yeah, thank you for the question. So so the answer is yes and no. So yes, in the sense that for sure, if you look at I didn't mention it, but if you look at the laws that I mentioned, the coercive labor laws around vagrancy. Uh, masters and servants, similar type things like you know, loitering, et cetera. So, so they're very, very similar to these, like the black codes in the United States that were used to coerce African-Americans after the end of slavery into prison and then to use their labor. So, so the system that we are looking at in, colonial, in British colonial Africa um, with prison labor around this early 20th century to mid 20th century period is much more similar to the convict leasing period in the United States, right? So the, I would say circa 19th, 19th century in the United States um, than it is to, you know, definitely the, you know, I'm not gonna make any connections to UK, US incarceration today, uh, but, but it's much more similar to convict leasing where again, you had uh, particularly black American men that were, were, were you know, after the, the, the end of slavery, they kind of coerced into prison using these like small crimes about vagrancy, et cetera. And then their labor is used to build the railway uh, but the, the key difference with us are, are what we're studying in that period also, one of the key differences, there, there are a few differences, um, is that their labor come under convict leasing in the US in the 19th century is able to be used for private sector, right? So in our context, because again, the British are very, very careful about not you know, wanting to be viewed as being engaged in the slave trade. So they say, look, you cannot use the labor of the prisoners for private sector. You can only use it for public sector government work, right? So in that sense, you can argue that it's for the development of the colony and not for profit for private sector people. So that would be the key differences, but much more similar to 19th century public prison for sure in the US. Great. Um, another question in that area is, is where was forced labor kind of limited to prisoners or were there other forms of, of uh, forced labor use? And if so, how does that affect your analysis uh, since oh, that yeah. kind of affects the counterfactual? Yeah, no, great question. And the answer is yes, absolutely. There are other forms of forced labor I mentioned before that are being used. In fact, as I said, the prison labor is a small part of a much larger scheme of forced labor that is ongoing in British colonial Africa during this period. And, and I would say across European colonial Africa uh, during this period, because the French are doing this as well. 
uh, Congo very famously does this in a very brutal way. Uh, so, so, so they are all engaged in forced labor to some extent, and prison is just one small part. Right? And I mentioned the labor taxes is one way they do this, where they, you know, they force people to donate uh, free hours or free weeks or free months of their time to work on colonial public works projects. So, so you, you can write, and people have there's a, who, people in the room. There are researchers that are interested in doing this. There's it's such an open white space that we don't understand domestic forced labor, including in Africa. I think there's so much to be researched. And so you can write like whole book papers and books on this, but but yeah, there's a huge, huge scheme in the background on, on, on domestic forced labor that is not prisons. Now, in terms of how that affects our analysis, again, what we, we highlight is that yes, while incarceration, including in Nigeria, is relatively high, it's still like 0.4% of the population that's being incarcerated. So, so it's it's small relative to the entire population, even though it's relatively high relative to how much you know everyone else in the world is incarcerating people. Um, so, so we, we, we try and think very carefully around, you know, this is, this is a, a, small, a small part of the population and how that affects the economic outcomes. Uh, you can think of very, like, how does that affect economic conditions and wages, et cetera, that, you know, anyway, I, I'm going off tangent, but, <laughs> but there's a, the, the, if people are interested, I'm happy to talk later, but, but there, there's, there's definitely like ways that you can think of, um, it might affect like larger economic conditions, the wages of workers, et cetera. But we think not, you know, shouldn't affect it too much given that it's like 0.4% of the population that's being incarcerated. Thank you. Uh, and the last question for, for Roland, there were questions about how, uh, whether slavery is a, an important confounding factor for what, you know, what you're studying in, in this paper. In particular, the, the key factor that explains the kind of the heterogeneous impact of railroads is proximity to, to ports, right? Um, and have you thought about that? And, and, and how does that affect kind of your findings? Yeah, no, that's that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, the, the, the short answer is that uh, in you know the, the way we we design our analysis uh, takes into account the role of slavery. We didn't control for slavery uh, uh, directly, but we did control, I think, for for ethnicity, and also the fact that uh, we sort of. Um, conduct separate analysis for, for the North and the South uh, also takes slavery into account. Remember that uh, slavery uh, occur more intensely in, in, in Southern ethnic groups, okay? So in, in, in terms of uh, the, the, the intensity of slavery, so those ethnic groups are, were sort of comparable, you know, in our sample, basically. And, um, and, and also a confounding factor, like not, not a confounding factor, but um, a factor that is very highly correlated with slavery is, uh, is distance to, uh, to see, which we also take into account in the analysis. Great. Um, thank you both for a wonderful presentation and, and for addressing the participants' questions. Uh, as I said, we're, we can, we're unable to address all the questions, but um, uh, you know, both the teaching staff and others will respond to your questions and they will be available uh, next week online. And I'll hand it off to uh, Elias to give concluding remarks for today. Dear Messi, dear Roland, and dear Melinda, thanks big time for the very enlightening discussion and also for top-notch research. Uh, I like the fact that you know Belinda, you don't have to motivate to this crowd your work on Nigeria, but you know I, I just want to convey that uh, all of us who do research on Africa have found it hard in the past uh, ten years or more to, to convince people uh, that our work is relevant. Uh, but actually, as this initiative aims to illustrate, this is becoming somewhat easier. Uh, so uh, this is also uh, one of the lessons, I guess, coming out from, from here. So uh, next week, uh, we will continue effectively our discussion on colonization, and we will move on the period that has been coined as decolonization, uh, Leonard von Sekon will take the lead. Uh, he will present very exciting work uh, of him and uh, trying to see how the type of independence movements has shaped uh, Africa's uh, post-independence political path, uh, also based on his uh, personal journey. So next week, we will start discussing decolonization in the early years of post-independence, issues that have been recurrently asked by many of you, for example, the role of African socialism or the Cold War or the role of foreign powers during Africa's transition from 
uh, imperialism to independence uh, will be discussed by Leonor. And in the special session next week, we'll continue our discussion actually on colonial institutions, effectively elaborating on our discussion with Belinda today and zooming on taxation. Uh, European powers adopted and implemented various taxation schemes, uh, taxing Africans, taxing uh, co private companies actually, who were involved, which were involved in the continent. And we'll be very pleased to, to host uh, Juta Bolt and Lee Gardner, uh, who have done very interesting and exciting work on this area, both with a pan-African viewpoint and also zooming into some, uh, into some colonies. This Friday, as always, uh, our great uh, teaching team uh, we'll offer three recitation sessions. Uh, we're all very pleased uh, with the high attendance of those uh, uh, sessions. So um, our, our friends are waiting for you there. Uh, let me also flag that for those of you who are not only interested in African economic history, but also about climate change, tomorrow at uh, the Willard Institute for Business and Development will have the second event of the Towards the Net Zero event series on, on climate change with Lucrezia Reitlin and Senator Roland Cohen. Thanks again, Belinda, Messiah, and Roland for a very enlightening discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Please keep sending us comments, feedback, emails, and we'll do our best uh, to respond. Thank you all very much. Enjoy your afternoon.